It's now on, yes. It's a pleasure to be back with you. I hope you, got, you had a great lunch break exploring and connecting. Um, we are halfway through the summit. I hope the energy is still with us, is still here. And I think that videos like this one reminds us why we are here gathered together during three days, thinking, taking the time to provide and think how to continue providing quality mentoring to our mentees and our mentors. So I have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker. I'm going to give you three clues. Um, if I say Ireland, UNESCO, and empathy. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. He has published extensive research on mentoring and empathy. And he's here with us to share a keynote. Please welcome Patrick Dolan. Merci, merci Fiona. Et merci à Sylvia et à toute la famille uh, European Net Mentoring Network. Elle est très bonne pour vous ici. <laughs> you will note that uh, Fiona did not mention the word good looking. Young, kind. Anyway, I'm joking, of course. It's great to be with you all and uh, a pleasure to uh, just chat with you a little bit today about uh, mentoring. I should acknowledge that. Uh, the long relationship that uh, I have with mentoring, I suppose now, which dates back over 20 years, um, and uh, Mary Lynch and the, the crew from Froiga in Ireland, which I've worked very closely with from the original days, the early days of Big Brothers, Big Sisters coming to Ireland. So I feel in some ways we've uh, come around full circle. What I'm going to talk to you today, uh, and, and very much building, by the way, on the pioneering work of Jean Rhodes, who I describe as the mother of mentoring. I mean that as a total compliment to Jean uh, and her work. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today might challenge you a little bit. Um, and I'm suggesting that empathy and youth mentoring is just more than a human connection. And uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing um, and share with you, I think, which is a slight challenge for uh, youth mentoring, but a good challenge, not a, not a negative challenge. Um, so to um, sorry, I'm wrong way. start with, um, let's... Um, Let's look at starting points. So, um, first of all, the benefits of the mentor-mentee relationship in terms of better outcomes for young people, it has been well exercised. We, it's been really well established. And whether you look back at research, which is now, you know, apart from the research that uh, myself and my brilliant colleague, Bernadine Brady, and others did with Feroiga on the mentoring program in Ireland, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, but even before that, the, the famous PPV, uh, Public Private Ventures research by Tierney et al. You know, they, there's been a long establishment in the work of Jean and various other people, some of whom are here, uh, in terms of establishing that uh, mentoring works. So we know that youth mentoring works. Where I'm going to bring you today is going to challenge a little bit more around that, and I hope in a good way. So. I'm suggesting relationships are the key ingredient in activating empathy. And we're going to look at what that means. And I think it is the source of the enabler of the relationship. So I'm looking around the room, and I see people who are from different countries, different age gaps. Think back to when you were in school. Think back to a teacher who was kind. Think back to who you remember in school, and even teachers who weren't so kind. But if you think back to any relationship you had when you were a youth, and you think about a good one, you actually don't think about what the person did for you. You think about how the person made you feel. And uh, this can seem as a soft thing, but I'm actually arguing it's probably the most important thing. And I, I'll share why I think that. So the first point I'm making is I think that empathy 
is often either over uh, over assumed that it's there and or overlooked. And I have to say, just because uh, m mentors are fantastic in what they do, but not every mentor is empathic. And that's an interesting question. Anyway, we'll come back to that. So I'm, I'm quoting from Liz um, Seagal's work uh, in, in relation to this, what she calls social empathy. The second starting point <clears throat> is to remind ourselves, as we saw in the video, that mentoring is about the active compassionate relationship based on friendship, which is based on mutual respect. Respect from the mentors towards the mentee and from the young person towards the mentor, whether that's a peer-based or adult-based relationship. But like any relationship, any relationship you have or we have in our lives, you have to oil it like an engine. And I think on a week-by-week -week basis in the empathy relationship, uh, sorry, in the mentoring relationship, is the empathy that oils uh, the, the engine. So let's look a little bit more closely at what we're talking about when we talk about empathy. <clears throat> so empathy is the ability to understand and share the emotions and the feelings of others. Let's break that down. It's not about pity or sympathy. Pity or sympathy is about how, how the other person's situation makes you feel. It's not about what you do or what you understand in a full way uh, what's going on for the young person. So empathy can be cognitive or effective. Cognitive is you get into the other person's shoes and effective is that you emotionally connect with and for that young person. <clears throat> this leads, hopefully, to the concept of pro-social responding. And that's where you put empathy into action. And that's key. And we're going to look at why, why that's key as well. So one of the, the uh, areas in, that led me, in a way, to look at empathy relates back to way back to when I was doing my own PhD, and I was exploring the concept of social support and worked very closely with the brilliant Carolyn Catrona from Iowa State University at that time. But basically, there are three types of support that everybody in this room exists of. And you exist of it, and you only notice it most when you need it most. Social support is like a, um, a fire extinguisher. Most people only read a fire extinguisher when the fire starts. You don't think about how important social support is until you really need, about, need it. And there are three types of support you can have in your life. Practical support, where somebody does something for you, gives you money if you really need it, if you're hungry. You know, think a very practical thing, gives you somewhere to stay, gives you shelter. Um, you can have emotional support, which is where the person may not be able to give you anything, but gives you warmth. And caring. And the last is advice support. Uh, as a parent of three now well grown up children and two very small little grandsons, I've learned in my life advice is the most dangerous type of thing you can give to anybody. And in fact, I'm the victim of this myself because I look back in my life. Most advice I got over my life, I never took it, except for my wife, uh, who gives me great advice. But advice is a very tricky thing. It's very interesting when you think about advice as a form of support. But if, if you're distressed and somebody gives you a hug, that's emotional support. That's empathy in a real way, and that connects. No matter, they may not be able to solve the problem for you, but the fact you know that they are there for you is a key. So I'm saying there's power and warmth, and we should, should not see that as something fuzzy and mentoring. I'm going to argue something very strong in relation to that very shortly. <clears throat> so I think there's untapped potential. So the research shows very strongly, for example, on youth mentoring for young people who've been in the care systems, the importance of one caring person in the relationship for a young person in care is incredible. The work of Mike Steen, for example. And this can lead to youth-engaged citizenship. It can lead to transformative things in the lives of young people. Again, the evidence shows that. But that one caring person has to demonstrate empathy for the connection to work. 
This is from Kate Berardi's work, who uh, is at Penn State University, who I work very closely with it, for a number of years on her doctoral thesis. And she highlights the fact that empathy is innate, so it's natural. In some ways, you could argue what we do when you think of hate speech is we take empathy away from people rather than um, putting it into them uh, or leaving it with them. But even if you think of famous videos you can get on YouTube where you'll see a polar bear uh, or a bear not attack a child who falls into the zoo. I think the parents need to take responsibility for kids falling into pits and zoos. But anyway, but where the, um, the animal does not attack the child, it naturally can protect the child. It's innate in all of us to be empathic. Um, uh, but the good thing is you can learn empathy. You can cultivate it. This is really important. That <clears throat> all the research is showing now that young people, actually adolescence is the ideal time. We know this from boring neuroscientists, joking, neuroscientists, that empathy can be learned at the adolescent years. And that's why I think youth mentoring is so key for young people in this connection to empathy. And you can create it. You can separate the self from the other. And if we think of the fact at the moment, if you look at, and I know we're going to look at migration, for example, and the issues around that, even if we think of how we support young people who are new to our country, the difference between empathy and caring and hate speech is just, you know, it's, it's cosmic. Uh, and probably, you know, I was reading lately that loneliness is one of the biggest issues we're going to have to face in, in, in life. Uh, and there's a pandemic of loneliness. This really, all these things lead to to good and active empathy. So empathy is the ability to define it and understand of it. It's the ability to perceive another person's emotions. Um, it's the ability to understand the emotions during the interaction. And this is the key in mentoring. A good mentor is one that listens well and thinks about the emotion uh, uh, during the interaction with the mentee. And vice versa, it's also from the mentee to the mentor. Because you've got to remember there's only one person who benefits more in terms of well-being from an act of kindness in a mentoring relationship. There's only one person that re responds more than the mentee. Who is that? Anybody? The mentor. Have you not done something, I hope you've done something good for somebody, but you know the way you feel, it makes you feel when you do something good for somebody. I, I've, I could get into memories of ants when I was a kid doing the shopping for them. And I felt good that they bought me a bar of chocolate every time. I did the of course, I enjoy the chocolate. But I felt good that I was helping somebody else. So think about that. And then this ability to understand the other's emotions uh, gives you this ability to feel what another person is feeling. And you can differentiate yourself from others. By the way, I would say there is a warning. You can't have both empathy fatigue and empathy distress, and you need to be aware of it. So I'm not suggesting that empathy is the miracle cure here. It's not a panacea, but it's incredibly important. So my great colleague, Dr. Charlotte Silk, who is somewhere in the room here, I hope, um, but Charlotte and I, with a team at the University of Galway, we've been working on, on, our under, on developing empathy as a t an education tool for about seven or eight years now, I think. Um, and Charlotte has been a, a, to, to the fore in the work. I must totally acknowledge that. But basically, an empathy education program contains four things. Understanding what empathy is, thinking about it like practicing it, thinking what are the barriers to empathy that you have in your life? What's stopping you from being empathic towards somebody else? And that can be quite a challenge, as we're discovering. But the great thing is you can put it all into action. They're the four components of the ACE ASE program. <clears throat> but along with the program, we've got to remember the very basics. And the very basics applies, I think, as much in mentoring as it does anywhere else. So Andreas Bart talks about the presence model, being present for somebody. Hands up, and I want you to be honest, hands up in the room with somebody that you love in your life, that you've been talking to them, and they were on their phones, not listening to you, and totally ignoring what you were saying while you were saying it. Hands up. Who's that happened to? That you? Everybody put up their hand. Hands up. Who's been the soldier that you weren't listening when somebody was approached you? So you weren't present for the person. So 
I think that's a really important thing. If there is a mentoring relationship, even if it's going well, if the mentor is not present for the mentee, I think that is a devastating issue because that says so much about so many other things. And I wonder how often do we check how often are mentors present for the mentee. Three quick examples of that is there's a new UK study out which showed that coach mentoring uh, in soccer for, for young people who are living in disadvantaged contexts, that where the relationship had empathy, the outcomes for the young person were much better. That's really interesting. Again, with our own study with the BBBS Youth Leadership, we were looking now at social return on, on investment, and we just, Cormac Fork and a colleague uh, has just discovered that from the research with Veroiga, that there's a return of 9.5 to 1 in terms of a value as a social return on investment, but empathy is a core component of youth leadership. And then work that myself and a colleague at Penn State, Mark Bennon, are doing with young people living in the townships called Kalisha in Cape Town, We've looked at how the Make a Difference Foundation and the work they're doing, and again, the mentoring relationship that had empathy was stronger uh, with better outcomes. So this is something that I want to suggest to you that Charlotte and I are working on, and we're, it's, it's under construction. So we're starting to work on this idea of an empathy gauge, like, like a measuring gauge. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we've started working on it, and uh, we will be progressing it over the next year or two, particularly. So the idea of an empathy gauge is that you basically, stakeholders grade their empathy. They grade how empathic they are. It's an interesting question. Um, and uh, so, for example, if you were to grade, I, I sadly lo I lost a, a, fam a very close family member last year, and tragically, very tragically, and if I gauge Empathy was very strong, and then it waned away a little bit. And then a birthday reminds people I must, you know, they're, they're a ga there's a way of gauging this. And I think this is something that really could be a very useful tool. So Charlotte and I and other Bernadine and other colleagues uh, in, in, our, in our research centre are developing this at the moment with schools, because we have this programme in schools in Ireland, and it's about to go elsewhere in other countries for UNESCO. But I think you can triangulate this. So here's how you triangulate it. Um, so for mentoring, you could have it that the mentor grades their empathy, the mentee grades the mentor's empathy, and an independent person grades the empathy. And you can do it in each direction. And you can grade it, of course, across, across the four components. Understanding, is it there? Is it been practiced? what barriers are in the way, and what actions are in place. Now, this is slightly controversial, so I'm saying this with a small c, not with a large c. Small c, not a large c. But I would challenge uh, the push on outcome measurement a little bit on mentoring. Of course, outcomes are important, but process is as important as the outcome. That he who's been on Weight Watchers, that he who's fallen in love, it's part of life. The process is as important sometimes as the finishing line. Pour la France, pour le coupe de monde, let le même. I've known, because I've worked with UNESCO, when France won the World Cup in soccer, it was the games all along. Once they won it, it got a bit boring. The process is really important. And I think the process of mentoring and the process of empathy is something that we need to value much higher. And, you know, you've got to remember, in the past, certainly in the UK, Helen Colley's work, Kate Phillip, other people who measured mentoring, in the UK it was about education achievement. In the USA, you know, originally it was very much around behaviour outcomes, and in Ireland it was more about well-being. So we weren't even looking at the same things in the different countries. But I do think that the component of empathy should not um, be underestimated. And I would mention um, very recently, well, it's recent, uh, it's been recently published, the research of Nielsen and Ma, uh, and they use a thing called the flourishing scale, flourishing scale life flourishing scale, as a way of measuring uh, empathy and satisfaction in life. So, um, so before I finish, um, sorry, I'm gone totally off. I wanted to mention um, one person before I finish, if I can get to it. Oh, here we are. 
Yeah. So I've been very fortunate that um, I'm going to give you an extreme example of how empathy is so important in small ways and big ways. So I'm very lucky that I've been honoured uh, uh, by uh, UNESCO and the UN. I'm receiving this award. The last medal I won was for in, our, in Ireland we play a game called hurling when I was 14. So it's the first medal I got since I was 14. Um, but uh, joking apart, I've been given a UN medal in Yanis Karzok's name. So Yanis Karzok was from Warsaw. He was Polish. And uh, he was a children's writer. Um, he was a pediatrician. And he ran a children's home for Jewish children. And in 1941, he was told by the Nazis that he was, he was safe, he was fine because he was Polish, but that the Jewish, Jewish children were being taken to a concentration camp. And he said, uh, well, if that's the case, I'm going with the children. And he went with the children and sadly died with the children. And if you go to Warsaw, you know, there are libraries, streets, loads of places that commemorate Janusz Karzak. So that's the big way Janusz Karzak absolutely demonstrated empathy. The small way he demonstrated empathy was that every day he valued um, the, the kids, the young people and children and adolescents who were Jewish, who were in the orphanage. They rated the staff every day, and staff that they rated poorly over time were dismissed. Staff that they rated as caring and kind every day on their little indicator were given bonuses. So there is a man who stood up for what he believed in, totally stood up for what he believed in, but understood that probably the most important outcome was how, how young people felt they were being cared for. And my final comment is there's a difference between caring for and caring about as a mentor. You can care about somebody and be a good mentor, but if you care for them, you are giving them empathy. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Can you hold it? Thank you. Let's hit. Let's sit here if you want. Thank you, Pat, for bringing us back uh, to the warmth of human connections. Thank you. We're going to open the Q and A. Um, we're going to use the app, and uh, we can also have some microphones in the room. So is there any questions? Sylvia. Yes. Hi, Pat. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned something about learning empathy, teaching it to college students. Would you say a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's, uh, well, our own university in Galway uh, have a module on empathy education for third level students. But the primary one that I was referring to is the work of Kate Berardi at Penn State University, which was her PhD. And she developed a module for students right across faculties. It was students who were learning, you know, train, learning engineering, social science, geography, whatever. Um, and uh, they did it as a, an extra curriculum course on empathy. And she measured pre and post their experience of the course, which focused on understanding barriers, practicing, and doing a social action. And she got amazing outcomes in terms of increased well-being, better self-efficacy, uh, and you know, qualitatively, young people really engaged with. Th th the great way they said it was there's a difference between m they, some of them were mentors. Putting it bluntly, some of them were mentors on the college course who were doing it to tick a box. And by doing the program, they went from m just doing it to tick the box to actually doing it as something of value. And I thought it was a really positive. But Kate Berardi's work, not mine. Brilliant, brilliant work. Ute? Uh, thank you for this very moving presentation. Um, have you looked into the question if, or maybe it was there, but I'm, I sort of missed the extent, if, if empathy is contagious, do the mentees mm -hmm. get more empathy through the empathy of their mentors? Yeah, they do. The short answer is they do. But I mean, I think Charlotte, well, Charlotte's not down. But I, mean, I think some of the, I don't know if you know enough about that. I think the, the one of the issues is that, um, which we have to be careful around the empathy, is sometimes it's, we can have empathy where we only have empathy for people who are like us. 
not for people who are different to us or who don't share our views. And that's more of a challenge. So you can almost get a sense of false empathy, which is contagious. So if you think, for example, I've been really blunt about it, if you think of um, groups who encourage hate speech, uh, they may form a group where they reinforce each other with a lot of empathy, but then they don't show that empathy to the other. Um, so you could have contagious, but not in a good way contagious, but being more positive about it, of course you can have, have it that's contagious. In fact, I think there's, I'm trying to think of who did the research, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know there was research done where they looked actually at college students where random acts of kindness were uh, encouraged and uh, where it just became so popular to do it. It was just the feeling, I think it was nearly overdone, but it was, people felt so good about it, you know. If y'all want to give me five euro as I leave, you will feel very good about it. <laughs> <laughs> I will feel a lot better. <laughs> I'm joking. But it can be, I think there is a the potential, actually the potential has just been a nice person. I mean, what do you want to be remembered for in life? Mm. You know, I say this as I'm in the autumn of my career. My <laughs> wife has a different view on that one. But, they, um, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? Do you want to be remembered for writing a brilliant journal paper or has just been a decent person? Um, I find as I get older in life, I'm going to more funerals than I should, which is begin to worry me a little bit. But it's very often people get up at funerals, they don't talk about, they may talk about what a person achieved in their life, but they talk about how, how the person made them feel. And I think in mentoring, I get, I totally understand the need for outcomes and I understand the pressure on, on funding, but I do think policymakers need to calm, the, calm it down. Calm down a bit. L mm. let's, let's have it that, you know, mentoring in its own right, that helps young people get a bit of respite from the shit in their lives mm. should be valued. Don't you know? Don't just value the <laughs> other stuff. <laughs> anyway, I, I mean, my argument is kids need a break, basically. One question over there at the back. Do we have questions in the app? We have no questions in the app, Fiona. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not yet. Put that down to my charm. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Erica from Austria. Um, I once uh, talked to a psychotherapist, and she told me that when somebody doesn't feel enough empathy for a situation, sometimes the reason can be that uh, this person is sensible, and what he or she hears, uh, hears is too much. We talked about um, mm. asylum seekers and their stories they sometimes have to tell, what they have experienced on their way to Austria or in their home countries. And she said, don't think that if somebody blocks and say, and, and mm, uh, if, if, if the person is not able to stop the other one, then sometimes they get cynical or, or uh, tell the other person, I can't believe that, just to... to um, uh, to, to save, to protect uh, uh, themselves. And with that understanding, I sometimes could forgive somebody. Uh, I could see the other person in a different uh, light. I think that's important. When somebody can't feel empathy, sometimes it's not, he can't help. Yeah. Okay, and sometimes it has, uh, it has the di quite a different reason than you believe in the first uh, uh, thing. N yeah, no, absolutely. I com completely understand that and agree with that. And Charlotte and I, and, and the current work we're doing, one of the things that we are exploring is barriers, that, you know, which we need to explore it more about the barriers. But you can get both empathy fatigue and mm. empathy distress. Empathy distress is where it's just so difficult and there are things happening in the world that were, you know, that it is so difficult for the person to, it causes distress. You can have that if you go to a movie. Have you ever gone to a movie where you, I can't yeah. handle what's yeah. happening here? You know, mm. you, you know, that's empathy. Empathy fatigue is just that you're worn down. It's fatigue, it's tired. Mm. Mm. That's a different thing. But sometimes even acknowledging, uh, being able to acknowledge what you've talked about is as important, even being able to say to someone, even if a mentor says to a mentee, I find, I'm finding this difficult, 
that is reassurance for the mentee, yeah. which is better than saying, I'm not saying anything about this, because then the young person has to interpret it. Mm. And is there something organizations here can do in order to uh, either prevent or accompany our mentors that are in this situation? Well, the one thing you need, well, um, here's, here's me saying, but I think the one thing you need to do is you need to think about with your program is gauging empathy, judging, you know, gauging, because it's part of the culture. Um, I'm not saying this is happening, but if you had an empathy program where it's so focused on outcomes and, you know, all that goes with that, it can lose sight of the mission of what mentoring is about. I'm not saying that you go so woolly that you have no outcomes. I'm not that naive. But I just think the balance needs to be... I, my advice would be to, to um, think about auditing your empathy. Yes, we just heard about empathy, uh, fatigue, and stress. Jörg Belden from Germany. Here in front. <laughs> uh, about uh, empathy, stress, and empathy, fatigue. But I um, know people who showed the total opposite of it. Uh, they are, I have to do with many, a lot of, of uh, very empathic persons uh, who are extremely resilient, who are happy people, even if the situation is not the best one or is, is really uh, worse. Um, is just, just uh, uh, is, hmm. so, so is there um, um, a, a reason for, 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 for both of those uh, opposite... Um Absolutely, you're 100% correct. And in fact, um, I'm, I'm from my father died when I was very young. I'm from a very large family. And my mother was famous for her empathy. But she got bored when she wasn't helping somebody. You know, it was, it was what kept her going, I think. There are people who just... It, they f they it gets back to human flourishing. It's the capacity to flourish. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's no, I mean, it, it, it's not, um, you know, I worry about empathy and the whole AI thing, and I could get into that. That's another conversation. But um, mentors shouldn't be robots. I'm not saying they are, of course they're not. But it's being human to somebody is really, really so important. Mm. You should never, under, don't ever underestimate the value of just pure humanity to another person. Yeah. I think we can finish with this sentence, beautiful sentence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. Isn't that good? <laughs> Thank you. For the next conversation, I would like to invite your next panel moderator, Elisabeth Vernier, to join me on stage together with Juliette. Please, join me. Elisabeth, you're the advocacy manager of Do For A Job, and you're not coming alone. You're coming with Juliet. Uh, and Juliet, you will share your story, uh, your personal insights, and your experience with the uh, Do For A Job program. And I will give you this microphone here. Oh, you have this one. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Um, no, you don't have a mic. I think here, is it working? Yeah. Test? No. Test? Yes. It's tricky. <laughs> Thank you so much, Juliet, for uh, sharing your story with us today. Uh, so you are, were a mentee at Do For A Job. You're a young Colombian uh, who's lived in different countries and came to Paris to study and stayed. And then you knocked at the door of Do For A Job and got a mentor. Uh, her name is Brigitte. Can you explain to us, after what we heard with Pat Dolan, what this human connection with Brigitte, what did it add to your to your journey, and specifically to your journey into work in France? Yes, definitely. Um, so with my uh, duo with Brigitte, what happened is that I actually got a job while we were doing the program during the six months. But during the trial period, I didn't keep the job. <laughs> so it made the situation really complicated the fact that I didn't achieve this goal. And this impacted both of us. Um, at the beginning, I was not doing very well, actually. And she really showed her support uh, towards me during that difficult time by understanding the situation and actually giving me space 
and time for me to come towards her because she knew that it was complicated. And talking about empathy, uh, she really showed that to me because afterwards when we talked about it, he said, well, actually it was difficult for me too because I felt like a failure to you. And I was like, no way. <laughs> you, you did everything, you gave me amazing advice. We both worked really hard. It's just sometimes the role doesn't fit what we actually had in our heads that it was going to be. And uh, this experience in particular, I think, is a great example of um, human connection and sharing experiences mm -hmm. together. And uh, yeah, it was really, really, really heartwarming knowing that she was there, but at the, st at the same time, her understanding that mm -hmm. I, at some point I needed my space and recovered from this failure. <laughs> so what I hear is that this moral support of someone who's by your side in good times and bad times exactly. was actually for you key to overcome this, uh, um, yeah. let's say, roadblock on your road to, to yes. a, a, a sustainable job. Um, and, you know, is the fact that you um, you had to change environments, you came from another country, uh, you didn't know the system, um, did it did it influence? Um, th was there something that Brigitte could could help you with, um, you knowing that you didn't know the environment that you that you came into? Yes, definitely. So I, I had professional experience in um, the UK and New York. But uh, in France, when I was working, it was an alternance, so it was a different environment because they, you were still a student. So with Brigitte, it was like my actual real job for the first time, and there was an issue when it comes to leaving work, the time that you leave work, <laughs> because the company was actually German, and the HR was telling me, okay, if you stay after hours, you have to put it in the system. But then my colleagues in Paris were staying after four hours, and they were not doing that. <laughs> and I was very confused, and it was like, is this a cultural thing? And Brigitte really like, yes, in France we tend to stay over. And she was explaining to me kind of like the importance of this cultural rule that I actually didn't know and never experienced before. And also understanding just the dynamics in the office, because I was a new employee, but I was still kind of like a junior position, and there was somebody else that was at the same role as me, but maybe she felt intimidated. So she was really there to provide this information, being someone that had so much experience in the professional work field, and also someone that is French. <laughs> so she helped me a lot with that. Yeah, definitely. It's like a, a game of... Is, is it like a game of cracking the code, of understanding the unwritten codes of, of the, the place that you're coming into, even if it's a labor market or uh, the society, you know, understanding what, how things work and, and things are not always written out, things are not always available. So you had that person who could translate to you what are the yeah. ways, uh, how, how they do it in France and even, you know, specifically in a sector or on the job. So that's that's. Really interesting. Thank you. If you had to um, like uh, summarize your experience in in one sentence, what would you say that this connection with Brigitte brought you? What what do you take away from it? Uh, for me, the main uh, takeaway would be that I wish I would have done it before, and I wish I could do it again <laughs> because it was really enriching. And I always think that no matter the age you have, me being 29 you can still learn from others a lot. And you always need this support and this uh, tool and resources that they have that you may not have gotten before. So, yeah. Thank you so much for Thank your you. testimony. <laughs> Thank you. you, you can. So I would now like to invite a fantastic panel, Barbara, Marion, and Peter, uh, who will discuss uh, a very interesting topic. Uh, we already touched upon it today. Um, we're going to discuss um, the, the needs of uh, migrants specifically and what mentoring um, can, can offer to migrants. Um, so yeah, you can have a seat. Um, so I myself working for a duo for a job, but I'm trying to be impartial here today uh, and moderate this session. 
Um, first of all, I, I would want to explain a bit why um, we do this topic today. Um, what is what is the topic of today? Um, so we all understood that young people face a lot of challenges in their lives. Um, there, there are a lot of questions. I remember Esme, I think it was yesterday, saying that um, it's a period in which you ask yourself so many questions and um, in which you actually don't know which roads to take and you get lots of advice as well. Um, and the fact to, to be able to talk to someone um, is, is a real aid. But when we talk about uh, youth with a migrant background, um, it adds really a layer of complexity. Um, you, you are still young, you still have a lot of que questions, you're unexperienced, but um, apart from that, you change environments and you come into a place in which you have to read the codes, in which to have to know where to go uh, for places. Um, there can be layers of vulnerability, like um, psychological um, vulnerabilities um, or... Um, all kinds of situations that you can get into. Um, I'm thinking about reception systems that doesn't work accordingly. Um, so that all of that adds a layer to complexity and being young and being a migrant, um, well, you know, is a kind of sum of, of, of different um, layers of, of complexity in your life. And so today we're going to discuss how mentoring can address um, those kind of needs. Um, so I, I'm welcoming uh, the panel of today. First of all, um, Barbara, um, you're working at uh, Punta de Referencia in Barcelona, uh, in Spain. Um, you're a uh, social educator leading a uh, foster program uh, for young mi migrants. Um, and your association is also very uh, known for mentoring uh, programs for, uh, for migrants in Barcelona. Could you explain us a bit more um, what your um, organization is doing specifically um, for, for migrants, for young migrants, um, and who do the, the target group is that you see in your daily practice? Okay. Hello, everyone. And I, first of all, I wanted to apologize for my English. As you know, it's not That's my not necessary. <laughs> I do some mistake, but well, I'll try my best. Um, well, so in our organization, as you, as you told, like uh, we do the different programs, like uh, the mentoring programs addressed to people, uh, young people that uh, have been um, under uh, under care of the system, uh, to say it somehow, and also like the big group of uh, newcomers, like uh, mm, unaccompanied manos, and also. Uh, youngsters that uh, maybe came like w once they had uh, they turned 18 but uh, they faced uh, a lot of difficulties to like uh, get to the transition to the adulthood so uh, these people are uh, aged between 16 and 23 and what all they have in common is uh, all these difficulties uh, like uh, this uh, language barrier like the codes uh, that they have to learn like in this uh, new society. And also like the, the thing that uh, they don't have like a sometimes uh, legal documentation to be in, in, the, in the country. So uh, I mean during the like in the meanwhile, uh, till they uh, can get this uh, permission to be there, like they have to face like this um, uh, educational um, gap that they have some lack that they have on the basics uh, sometimes because maybe they have only attended like a few years of the uh, education on their country so they don't have like the basics covered so they mm -hmm. it uh, makes a uh, difficulty not to, to access to this uh, educational system here and also like uh, the frustration that they're carrying on because Sometimes uh, they just came here, like thinking that they could, like, uh, look for a job, like, no, insert themselves, access, like, um, to the labor market easily, and it's, it's they find it very hard no, when, once they're here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, then we have um, Marion. Oh. We have Marion Hebert. You're working, or Hebert, Hebert. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce Hebert, it. Hebert. Yeah. Hebert. <laughs> Hebert. You're working at uh, Codico, uh, an organization um, who is uh, helping refugees specifically uh, to get into employment. Um, you're the dissemination manager. Could you explain us um, what Codico is doing and in what ways it might be different from what Barbara explained before? Yes, so Kodiko was uh, created in 2016 when there was actually a lot of Syrian refugees coming to uh, to Europe and also to France. Um, so we help indeed refugees in their journey towards a sustainable social and uh, professional integration. 
one of our main difference is actually that we we help um, refugees so that are from 18 to 65 and plus. So we really act on uh, the professional um, integration. Um, the aim of Codico is also to try to change the perspective of the, the refugees on the French labor market. So we've designed to do that. We have designed a program. It's a six months program um, where there is indeed um, mentoring. And so we pair a refugee with um, a professional, so someone who's really in their active life. Uh, and we work with partner companies um, so it means that uh, we have different partners uh, and they give time to their employees during their actual uh, working hours so that they can um, mentor a refugee. Um, they do see each other at least twice a month and uh, work on the, prof the project, uh, the professional project um, together. So this is the individualized support and we also have uh, our collective support. So in that, we have collective workshops. Um, we also have um, focus groups and uh, social activities. And that's an important part for actually the young uh, wrong refugees we, we support. Thank, thank you, Mario. Barbara already touched upon some of the barriers um, that, that uh, the, the target group she works with um, uh, faces. Um, I wrote down language barriers, um, legally, um, like problems around residence permits, um, non skills that are not recognized, frustration, but also access to services, access to education, access to the labor market. Um, do you is that something you recognize? And are there other barriers that you um, recognize in your practice at Codico? I think you've mentioned yeah, one of the main barriers that we could all mention is uh, the language barrier. This is one of the hardest to tackle. Uh, so we, for example, we provide complementary French lessons uh, in our program. Also, uh, computer, uh, computer uh, literacy skills, uh, these are important to tackle. Um, we also see a lot of self-censorship and a lack of self-confidence especially with the young uh, refugees that we, uh, we work with, um, and the lack of network. Uh, when it comes to getting a job in a new, in a new welcoming country, um, network is such a key. And this is why we've built um, this social network around the refugee um, so that we give a social but also professional new network. Um, so they go to job affairs, they actually meet new professionals in order also to see if it's a new job that they can actually project themselves in. Um, we also create events with other partner organizations so that actually actually get to meet um, other young refugees but also young maybe French uh, people uh, and young professionals or experienced professionals. Network is very important, as we already heard before, also in uh, in the testimony. Well, um, maybe yeah. just one important difference is that we uh, have chosen to um, accompany the ones that actually already have settled. Uh, so they do not have, they will, they might have, but they have the legal uh, papers to be able to work. and. This is also because we advocate and we work with the companies and we try to you know, tell them exactly that there is no specific uh, administrative uh, work to do to hire them. So this is also why we work with specific um, refugees that already have the protection status. And that's a different from your organization. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you want to uh, have, a, have a word on that and um, comment on the, the barriers. Um, was there something you, you recognized or something you want to add? Um, no, I, th I agree with her. With, uh, sometimes we also work with refugees and of course they come with a, a, like, um, like a permission to work. So this is a, like a, the basic, no? because you can 
a company like the, the, the access to the labor market if they have the permission because you're like uh, like dealing with this frustration that they're carrying on that, that I was talking before. So now in, in the beginning we focused with this uh, uh, language uh, barriers that they have and work with this. So in the future when they are prepared and they're like closer to get this uh, work permission, we can just focus to the, the access to the labor market. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, um, so I, I'll present you, Peter, you're a researcher at KU Leuven uh, in Belgium, in Flanders, and did a lot of research on, on mentoring specifically, mentoring for migrants. Um, do, you, do you recognize these needs, these barriers for, for migrants, and how can mentoring, according to your research, uh, answer these, um, these barriers or, or respond to these barriers? Well, uh, well, I did res research about mentoring to work, professional mentoring, but also more general uh, mentoring for migrants. Um, and if we talk about mentoring to work, I think um, these uh, adding to uh, professional networks is very important. Um, I think this is ac actually a, a unique added value that mentoring can have. Um, because the mentor is a professional, he has a professional network, and he can introduce uh, the mentee to his own professional network to help them to find a job. And all those mentees, refugees, they lose their professional net network with their flight to their new country, so this is really an important um, uh, thing or an, an important added value that uh, mentoring can bring. Um, I also I think the, um, the, the, the lack of confidence um, is an important barrier because especially with highly educated um, newcomers, you see they are losing their professional identity. Eh? They were a doctor in their country, an engineer. They come to a new country and then their diploma is not recognized um, and they lose confidence, you know, they are like, I don't, nobody, nobody recognize them. They go to the employment service and they say like, uh, you can have a cleaning job, you know. So it really um, affects their self-confidence and if you are matched with a mentor that is, for example, active in the same uh, professional field, he can help you to um, establish, to recognize the professional entity identity you have before, for example, you have an engineer talking to an engineer and it helps to gain the self-confidence again for the mentee. So I think, that, I mean, there is a real added value on mentoring to work. Um, um, a second uh, form of mentoring is uh, social mentoring for uh, migrant newcomers and refugees. Um, and we did some research uh, among mentoring coordinators uh, in these projects that um, help uh, migrant newcomers. Migrant newcomers, these are people who are maximum one year in the country. Um, and we also see a lot of um, added value. Sorry, Pat, we, it was outcome mapping. Uh, we, we, we tried to map outcomes of mentoring programs. Um, and we, we saw some real added value. And I think uh, first uh, thing we saw is that um, mentoring really helps enhancing social networks of newcomers. Uh, in most of the cases, the mentor was actually the first person, uh, the, the first native born person they talked to in the new country who really listened to him. And some mentors introduce them to their friends, go to them to a bar, to a cafe, and they learn or they build their social networks through this mentor. So this is a first uh, effect or outcome we saw in these uh, mentoring programs. Um, what we also saw is that um, it enhanced participation in society. The mentor was actually a bridge to a sports clubs to participation and culture, um, and um, some mentees, they didn't want to leave their house, but the mentor helped them to participate in society. So it has the effect of participation. Um, it also helps with developing competences, for example, language learning. They, they can practice language, um, but also, and maybe more important, it's a safe space, the mentor and the mentee, 
And a lot of people, well, they learn language at schools, but they don't dare to speak it. Yeah? And with the mentor, they dare to speak the language, um, and they actually gain self-confidence in speaking the new uh, language. The safe space provided by the mentor helps uh, with that. And this leads actually to, to um, more personal well-being of these mentees, of the newcomers. There is less loneliness. They feel bit better. They engage in activities. So we see a real added value of this uh, mentoring uh, project. Um, and maybe also important is that we don't only see this with mentees, but also with mentors. I mean, European uh, Commission stresses the two-way streets of migrant integration. And we see these effects occur, like mentors are more understanding about uh, what it is to be a newcomer, what it is to integrate in a new society. They are more open um, to newcomers um, and to diversity. So we see that this buddy project, it's called buddy project in Belgium, um, help or have outcomes both on the side of the mentor as on the mentee. And I think this is quite promising. Yes, it's a two-way street, uh, as yes. you said. Yes. Um, maybe Barbara and Marion, I'm addressing the questions to both of you. Maybe two reactions. First, on um, how, do you recognize this added value of mentoring with the, the target groups you're working with? And second of all, um, what do you think about this effect on mentors? Um, it, do you also observe that, that the fact that they're mentoring newcomers uh, also changes their vision on society or um, creates more openness? Um, I don't know who wants to react first. So regarding the, the training of the mentors, we actually f sometimes talk about co-training uh, to talk about this two, um, this win-win um, program. And we really do spend a lot of time training our mentors. Uh, we train them on um, the journey of exile. Um, we actually also really f um, tell them not to um, ask uh, the refugee about he or her journey. That's really important because it can it can just bring back a lot of psychological, um, you know, a trauma, trauma. And so we talk about you know, social um, and mental health of. Um, the efficient uh, well, the people that we work with, um, we also give them training about the rights um, posture. Um, so we talk about empathy, <laughs> of course, but not ex maybe excessive empathy and how to have the to put the right limits. Um, so, for example, we. We have had cases where uh, uh, refugees might call uh, late at night or um, might not come uh, to an appointment. And so that's when it comes really important to, you know, go back to the right codes. Professional, they are professionals. So it's just, you know, reminding uh, that it's important and to respect uh, also the other's time. And this we give a training, and so they have initial training, but we see them every single month uh, collectively. So there is this, um, uh, you know, collective exchanges about the experience, uh, so that they also actually can a step, can take a step back and see how they are, uh, you know, themselves experiencing this intercultural. Um, aspects, barriers in, in terms of communication. Um, so I think, yes, the training is a key um, for a very sustainable and success successful mentoring. Uh, then you said regarding, the first question was? Um, the effects of mentoring first on the, on the, the added value of mentoring for the, for the migrant or for the, the refugee the, themselves, yeah. but also the effect that the mentors get from the experience? What, what does it change in their what opinions? We yeah, we usually have a lot of mentors saying that they they received more than they actually were giving. Uh, and uh, like f to see what um, uh, they get, we we have a, a lot of uh, Im impact measurements. We, so of course, we measure the um, 
um, the number of them that actually get a training or a good job after our program, and we are at right now at 77% of them six months after our program, so that's great. But we also look uh, at how many of them are actually independent and gained autonomy in their research. And we've got 88% of them saying this. I can think about, uh, for example, Wally. Uh, he's, uh, I talked to him a month ago. He's a uh, 20 year old from Afghanistan, and uh, he went to every single of the 12 uh, work, um, collective groups. He went to all of the social activities. Uh, uh, he was always uh, willing to participate in all of the activities. Um, showing really great uh, empathy towards his peers as well, um, her, like his peers, yes, yeah, sorry. And um, he joined um, an, apprentice, an apprenticeship just uh, months ago in, his, in the field that he wanted um, to be an electrician. And he himself wrote the impact measurement. Usually they do it together, the mentor and the mentee. He wanted to write himself. And he basically says, wow, I'm now able to, uh, to make an interview on my own. I'm able to go to a job fair on my own. And I will be able to look for a job on my own when it will, when we, it will happen again. And this is really what we aim, yeah. <laughs> I recognize that very much from uh, from you for a job as well. But first to you, Barbara, um, okay. what do you think is the added value um, of, of mentoring uh, to the, mm, like the impact, huh? to the yeah the impact to first of all to the to the mentees themselves who are in a situation of migration, um, and secondly the impact on the on the mentors. What do you see happening in that kind of relationship? Mm -hmm. Okay, so firstly, I think that uh, on the mentees, like a clear increase in the social capital, which is very important to to develop in a new, new society, no? Like by uh, learning the language, like uh, being able to read the codes and the lines, and to get to know, um, like, a, well, to increase the social network, like. Uh, through the having like uh, these adult references that ca can the mentor provide, but also like through the mentors, they were saying like my colleagues, no, like uh, the people, that the family or friends from the mentor, and also like the people that they get to know in the activities that they participate in the community, and so on. Also, I think that uh, it's very important to uh, like the, the impact that. Um, this uh, presence, uh, like uh, this, the, the the attitude that the mentor have uh, besides the the mentee, like can provide them, like uh, which uh, is, uh, for example, um, like the increase of the self confidence, like the uh, belonging sense to a group, like when they participate to some different like uh, activities or uh, recreational places and and also this um, having someone there you know, like having someone that is uh, like that, you know that you can count with to explain what you have you're like going through I don't know like the this all this uh, emotional impact that the immigration itself has you know, that they carry on these young people that they don't have their families here to give them this support in the every day. And on the other hand, I think that on the mentor group, uh, they also win in this um, empathic behavior, you know, that uh, they, if, if they are like being there, like uh, listening with this uh, empathic uh, attitude, uh, also being more open, you no, know, uh, also, being able to create by, by themselves, the, but their families, uh, friends, no, uh, to contribute to a more diverse like uh, society, being able to understand the migration phenomenon, no? and and also like being part of this social transformation that we need. Uh, uh, I didn't tell, I didn't explain it before, but uh, like the most of the people that we work with is like the mentees in our programs are coming from the from Africa, like uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and also Maghreb, 
and they all like uh, arrive here in a country that um, is, um, I don't know, with an increasing Islam Islamophobia. And I think that sometimes they find an, a, hostile, a hostile context. And by the uh, approach that the mentor can do to themselves and understanding these uh, feelings that they have, they can all contribute no, to, to have a, a, a more um, open society you know, and, and to give more support and having like, the, the skills to host the people, uh, like the young people mm -hmm. or the migrants in general. Like so it actually there's an influence on the host society and, and with mentoring, or mentoring is a tool to make the environment more welcoming uh, in general and to um, fight against prejudices that might live among um, uh, the um, not newcomers, let's say, the uh, inhabitants. Yeah. Of course, I think that they spread the word, no? Like uh, by telling their friends, their families, like people in the work, like about their own experience about mentoring. And I think that's so mm -hmm. valued. Mm -hmm. Peter, hearing all of this and hearing also about the, the barriers and how the host society, how it looks like for uh, a young migrant or migrant to, to arrive, um, isn't that a lot of pressure on the shoulders of a mentor and, and how to navigate these roles and responsibilities um, of the mentor in a context that is not always easy? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, I think. If we speak about critical success factors for mentoring programs for migrants, this is a crucial one. Um, because uh, yeah, you have to uh, realize that uh, yeah, people are new here. Here they are looking for housing, employment. They have to put the children to school. They have to learn the language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then there comes this mentor, um, and whoa, it's the first person who really listened to them. You know, um, they have their social worker, but this social worker has 200 files, so it's quick, quick, quick. And then they have the integration officer, and it's just the same, quick, quick, quick. And then, so that's the first person who, I mean, it's out of the testimonies, out of the interviews we get, the first person who really listened to them um, and take their considerations and needs into account. And then you have the problem that they start asking everything to the mentor. Can you help me with the housing, with administration, with employment, with the children, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, um, and mentors are sometimes uh, overwhelmed uh, by this. So, um, um, so I think it's really important to, um, yeah, to, to to have clear goals, limits, and boundaries on this mentor on these mentoring programs, and this can be part in a in a training, for example, to, to say, to sketch what roles and boundaries are. Um, an example of, of how um, Belgian projects deal with it is a, um, a very specialized view on, on mentoring, like you have mentors for housing, you have them for digital skills, you have them for leisure activities. And that's the way they try to 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 guard these uh, uh, boundaries. So this is really a challenge um, for a lot of mentor coordinators and mentor projects. We we actually see, yeah. And there is no one solution mm -hmm. for it. I think. Um, and maybe a, a second, if I may, yeah, is um, the cooperation with um, professionals and public services because migrant newcomers have a lot of, what is it, social workers and integration officers, et cetera, et cetera. And they all have their role, you know. They, they all help, in a way, uh, the newcomer migrant. But then the question is, how um, does the mentor fit in? Eh? What's the exact role of the mentor and what's this of the social worker and of the one who's the language teacher and of the integration officer? And it's also, I mean, also for this question, we don't have clear-cut answers, but we see that uh, mentor coordinators are struggling with this uh, topic. And one of the, the, the solutions we see in the Belgium cases is that, for example, they do intakes um, with mentor, social worker, um, mentee, and, for example, the, the officer from the integration office, and then they discuss among each other who will do what and how do we communicate uh, with each other? 
What I recognize in what you said, Barbara, before on um, uh, difficulties with accessing uh, in different areas of life, accessing education, edu accessing social rights, accessing uh, the labor market, and then uh, you have a mentor who has this kind of holistic view of all these services available um, and, and, and can also kind of be a compass in, in, in that um, area of all, all these different uh, service providers there are. Um, so I, I think actually it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's also a... Um, uh, it can be a, a, a very rich to have someone who has this overview and has this holistic overview of uh, of the whole situation. Well, Elizabeth, what? there are uh, questions coming in for the from the audience through the app. Okay. Do we have time for uh, some questions? We, I think it's about time for questions. Is it questions. time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Shall we kick Tell out me. with the first one? Yeah. So it's from Desiree. Desiree is asking many great questions, by the way. I got you. <laughs> uh, do you have mentees coming back to be a mentor? Question for you all. Um, we, have men we have a few mentors coming to be mentors. Um, we also have mentees that um, actually become um, what we call connectors, which are volunteers, um, and they take part of the coordination. So our connectors, um, volunteers that help, or can be like coaching or mediators if needed between the mentee and the mentor. And they are in direct uh, connection with our coordination team or, for example, a um, program manager. And uh, so they've been already in, they've experienced the mentoring and, um, ex and they can actually be great connectors. But we only have for now well, it's less than 5, 10% of our uh, former mentees that are actually taking this journey. So they're alumni and they become mentors themselves after they've been a mentee. Non mentors, usually more um, connectors. Connectors, okay. yes. Volunteers in the association. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have like a mentees becoming mentors right now, but I have to say that it's a work in progress project that we've been thinking about for years and maybe we're, we're going to implement in the future. Looking around your audience. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, a, Peter. Yeah. I'm not in the program, of course, but I, I, I know some programs where ex refugees are the mentor. Maybe they're not in the mentoring program, but ex refugees who, uh, who know all the hurdles, all the obstacles, they become a mentor of the, of the mentee. So I think this is a, also an interesting way to, to, to build your mentoring program. One question in the audience. Esme, could you uh, bring a microphone? Thank you. My name is Wen, and I am officer manager of um, mentoring in two gr group two. And why do you think you can transform um, mentees in mentors? What do you think you, it doesn't happen? What's the biggest uh, bottleneck? Because we have the same problem. <laughs> I, I can answer quite easily for us. It's because, as mentioned, the specificity of Codico's mentoring program is that we want to recruit our mentors within our partner company par uh, within our partners, so private partners, um, and so that they become uh, actors of the change. They talk within their own company and the recruitment policies, uh, you know, the culture uh, changes. And so it would be a challenge to only target and it would, we would not be uh, sensibilizing as many people if we were recruiting them from our previous uh, mentees. So this is why we guide them more uh, to become volunteers. Yeah, this is yeah, in our case, uh, the main difficulty that we uh, cope uh, when thinking about like implementing this, uh, this mentees becoming mentors is that uh, when we look for mentors, uh, we look for a specific uh, age gap between them because uh, as we like a company, like a, a transition to adulthood, they have to be adults like already emancipated who, who are settled 
and have uh, economic stability somehow, or like uh, having a job, whatever. So our mentors are um, over 30 year old, and our mentees are uh, uh, 16 till 23. So it's uh, a little difficult, but we are like still uh, in contact with uh, mentees that have participated in the last years. So. Maybe in 10 years Maybe. still. Go. Well, we've been like doing that for almost 30 years now, so uh, we can look like uh, backwards. Okay. Any more questions from the public or? Yep. Yeah, just a small question to you from Kodiko. Um, Maybe uh, I'm sort of, uh, I heard it in a specific way because of Pat Dolan's uh, keynote about empathy. empathy. You mentioned your recommendation to your mentors that they should not ask the mentees about their um, journey or their experience. Do the, the mentees know about this recommendation? And what happens if the mentee wants to talk about it? Do they get a space for it? Do you offer a space or a situation where they can talk about it? Because sometimes maybe it's necessary to, to do so. Um, we do, yeah, we do not say to the mentees that they should not talk about their uh, exile journey. Um, and uh, they ha do get this space usually because we really um, advise the mentors to receive the mentees in a, you know, a, sp a safe environment. They usually do have like an, more than an hour and a half together and they see each other for six months, five to six, six months. So Sometimes actually it happens three months once there is actually a very uh, strong relationship and there is trust uh, between them. But um, sometimes what happens is after the mentor needs on a space also to talk about what happened. And that's why we have those, um, those contacts every month with them collectively, and they also have their own connector. So the volunteer that I talked about, his role is actually to call the mentor and uh, ask him how he's doing. So he's the buddy of the mentor. And sometimes they need uh, also support to you know, you know, digest sometimes very uh, strong emotions. Barbara or Peter, do you want to react? Uh, well, I didn't explain before, but uh, we also train our mentors as uh, they are not professional, our mentors. We have a, a staff like that's uh, the one dedicated to uh, uh, provide guidance and support during the process uh, to the mentee and to the mentor. And is the one also like uh, having these connections no, to the uh, labor market, to other professionals that helps with, with uh, these ideas. But well, in, in, in this side, like uh, talking about the advices to the mentors, we do a training. And also this is a, a topic that we discuss in, 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 the, in the first uh, sessions because it's very important uh, to think, uh, to be conscious that this person has been through like a, a process with a lot of professionals that have asking have been asking for this uh, question that sometimes can could carry a trauma and, mm -hmm. and you're not conscious and you're just directly pointing to the thing that it's you don't know what what is behind it no so uh, I think that uh, we better um, like give the space to the, the the young mentee to explain it if they want to explain, if they want to talk about the journey. If not, it's not even necessary. Like you can create uh, an emotional link to someone and not uh, explaining this until five months after or even five years, you know, or, mm -hmm. or never talking about that and talking about other topics. I think that it's like a thing that we have to learn to respect because if it was someone uh, coming from, I don't know, other country, we, we, we wouldn't ask for that, no? Only for countries like, obviously have like a disadvantage, no? Because they have like a wars or, I don't know, economic uh, difficulties, so. We have room for one last question, uh, if there maybe is. Maybe I would also add that we do not also ask them 
to tell the story. We really do ask them about professional uh, uh, projections, uh, professional uh, expertise, skills, because we want to s everyone to see them as professionals and not as refugees. Mm -hmm. you some, so many of them just come to us and or come to uh, um, a job uh, dating and say, I'm uh, Wally and I'm a refugee. So we have to do the whole narrative and change it so that they actually just say, I'm a professional in blah, blah, blah. And this takes time. <laughs> Is there one last question? Or if not, then we can wrap it up. What I remember from what I will take away from this session is, well, there are some um, very specific barriers for newcomers, for refugees, for migrants um, when they arrive uh, in, in, in the society. Uh, it can be a bit about language, about residence permits, uh, skills recognition, diploma recognition, but also uh, frustration, self-confidence who's low, self-censorship and a lack of network. Um, and the mentor is actually an added value uh, to that, um, can open this uh, social network, um, work on social capital, create participation in the society, develop competences in this safe space, and to create a safe space, um, and that's what we heard as well, training and intervision and supervision coordination is very important by a third organization um, to manage these roles and responsibilities of the mentor, uh, to uh, be able that the mentors also uh, have someone to talk to when they have to listen to difficult stories um, and to give them the tools um, to work with vulnerable people or people experiencing difficult situations. Um, thank you, uh, panel, for uh, sharing your experience, be it academic or field experience, and um, I'll hope to see you at the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, too, for moderating the session. It's my thank pleasure. <laughs> Thanks to the panel members thank again. You. Thanks. So that brings us to the last plenary session of the second day of the summit. Um, Correct. So now let's grab some coffee. Let's give the energy up again for the master classes. We have four master classes happening this afternoon. Maybe and grab two coffees. Or three. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so others, yeah. And then uh, what's next? What's next? Well, we'll see each other at 7 at the afterward mingle. It's 50 minutes uh, Walk from here and we have tapas and drinks. So we hope to see you all there. Yes. <laughs> Enjoy.